and good morning to everyone. I am uh, delighted to be on the agenda this morning and to share some work around transitions and in particular kindergarten transitions. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen, um, which means that you all are going to disappear. So I would echo the uh, request for questions or comments in the chat box and Nikki and Dina, if you'll keep an eye on that, um, then we'll move through this next portion in a really similar way. Um, so I too recognize many faces and names out this morning, um, but will introduce myself. My name is Becca Steinhoff. I am the <clears throat> executive director of Wyoming Kids First and the John P. L. Bogan Foundation um, and have had many hats in this early childhood space. Uh, but get to speak this morning first about kindergarten transitions, um, largely as a result of my partnership with Nikki Baldwin and the Wyoming Early Childhood Outreach Network um, and the state's preschool development grant. So we have time over the next few hours to talk about this topic of transitions. And so I'll start this morning by uh, talking about the a little bit of the history around this work and then uh, move into our existing vision and strategic direction for the work that we're doing now, uh, which will include uh, uh, some conversation about a transitions framework and transition grants. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn the time over to Nikki again, so she can talk a little bit about um, the evidence base that we use when we think about this transitions work. And then, um, Best for last, I think, in this case, we will hear from two communities, Teton County um, and Lincoln County, about some of the actual implementation work that they've been able to do in their communities around kindergarten transitions. And then we'll wrap up with some next steps and some hopes to connect further with all of you. So um, I am remiss too if I do not talk a little bit about the leadership funding and partnership that makes this work happen. Um, and so we, although there has been great uh, energy around transitions for quite some time, it was Wyoming's preschool initial grant and renewal grant uh, that really allowed there to be a lot of momentum. And so um, that preschool development grant has a leadership team um, and a strong group of people who help oversee and guide those dollars, including the governor's early childhood state advisory council. Um, and then there are um, additional dollars from the John P. L. Bogan Foundation, from White Econ at the University of Wyoming and the Wyoming Community Foundation that go into um, funding this and providing that critical leadership. And we also um, have had great partnership with the Wyoming Department of Education, the Head Start Collaboration Office, and the Department of Family Services. And so this is not a, an exhaustive list of partners, but some really key people um, who have identified the essential nature of transitions and are committed to seeing this through. Um, and about the same time that we received word um, that Wyoming was awarded a preschool development renewal grant, we also heard from the Education Commission of the states that Wyoming was selected as one of seven states to have uh, some support around kindergarten transitions. And so we were really happy to work with Julie Poppy at Be the Agenda um, and have some additional support from the Education Commission of the states in connection uh, with that, with those other states who participated in that cohort. So that strengthened and just enhanced and advanced what we were already able to do. So this is a quick look at some of the leadership funding and partnership. Um, who is not listed on here, of course, is the long list of community partners or program partners that we have across the state um, who have also committed themselves to this work. So this is a look at that state level system um, that provides key leadership funding and partnership <clears throat> for some of the work that we'll talk about. Um, we just give some acknowledgement to the history of this work around transitions. I think it's safe to say that uh, we would all acknowledge and um, get behind the fact that the transition to kindergarten is a critical juncture and it's one that's worthy of celebration also one that can be quite stressful. And so from different lenses over the course of time, we've probably all thought about that transition. 
um, as educators, as families, as community members. Um, it's a, it's a trans transition that com comes up annually for our students. Um, and one that we, oh, hold on. I apparently am just looking at my own slideshow without screen sharing. So I'm glad that someone finally clued me in on that. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Let me share my screen so that you can see now what I am seeing. Um, so sorry about that. I have a little bit of a head cold and it must have impaired my good judgment this morning. So now you can all see the slide that says history as I'm talking about um, this work. So hopefully you have the handouts and you were consulting those. And thanks to Nikki for cluing me in on uh, what was happening there. So back to the history. Um, we would acknowledge then that that transition into elementary school from different settings um, means that students are bringing with them a variety of assets and experiences. We also know that there are now decades worth of research that shows transition activities that are authentic, meaningful, thoughtfully designed, really do make a difference for children's kindergarten experiences. And perhaps more importantly, that the quality of that transition can either exacerbate or ameliorate existing inequities related to their success in kindergarten or that first year of elementary school. Um, we knew from the moment that we started having some of these conversations about transitions that we wanted there to be a comprehensive perspective um, that required a focus on social, emotional, and health needs of children and families the culture in a community and individual schools and the resources that are available to support individual children, family members, educators, and school leaders. Um, let me be clear here that all the way through this presentation, I will talk uh, about the word school um, and, and I will use the word educators. And I am not using those in reference just to the K-12 setting, but that uh, those words also apply to the early childhood setting. So a school, is an organization or an institution that's designed to provide learning spaces and learning environments. So I use that to talk both about what's happening um, before kindergarten and after uh, that transition. So I just wanna be clear that when I use those words, we're talking about people before and after that transition. Um, in Wyoming, I think we could agree that uh, the approach to transitions has been very much community driven and state supported. Uh, and so it is very likely that you as an educator, you as a program are doing great work in this space around transitions within and across the early childhood system or into that first year of elementary school. More often, we would see that transitions are not the direct responsibility of any one person. So despite the importance of transitions that we would all agree to, um, they can often be overlooked or left to a handful of activities that lead up to the start of a new school year. And so what we wanted to do as a part of this work and where these conversations really began um, was to elevate the importance of transitions, to elevate the work that is already happening around the state, and then to insist that support for effective transitions should not be limited to some, but should be available to all students. Um, and also to recognize this as a years long process that requires cooperation across early childhood settings and schools. Um, perhaps said a different way, we want to align what children and families experience and how they experience it. And then we were lucky that the preschool development grant and in many ways COVID-19 really gave us a space to reimagine, reconnect and recommit. Um, and so Nikki this morning acknowledged <clears throat> the preschool development grant needs assessment and strategic planning process that engaged hundreds of individuals around the state in 2020. Um, many of you participated in that process and we're grateful um, for your feedback and your insight there. Um, and then we um, also wanted to embed the importance and elevate the importance of transitions within that Wyoming early childhood strategic plan. So transitions is one of six priority areas listed in that early childhood strategic plan. Um, and so you see on the screen that 
Um, there's a, a vision and a framework that, that talks about this work around transitions. And then the bullet points on the screen are the goals that are identified within uh, that document to be carried out within this priority area, starting in 2021 and moving through 2023. Um, and so the vision here is that children and families successfully navigate transitions and build their resilience and ability to navigate future transitions. Um, families, educators, and school leaders collaborate to thoughtfully connect children's and families' relationships and experiences across the early childhood years, and that communities in the state cooperate to ensure effective and supportive practices and policies recognize transitions as an ongoing process and place a special focus on the transition into the first year of elementary school. Um, and so this language is quite broad and it suggests that, uh, that transitions are not just the transition into um, elementary school, but that transitions are about change and that change is a constant feature in the lives of young children and families. And in fact, that early childhood, perhaps more than any other phase of life, is defined by that change. And so we have to um, begin navigating change early on as individuals. And so we want to think about those transitions that young children and families are experiencing within and across that early childhood system, which includes uh, that movement into the first year of elementary school, which for most children is kindergarten, but kindergarten is not mandatory in the state of Wyoming. So that first year of elementary school, whichever year it may be. Um, uh, the, the nod too to resilience and the ability to navigate future um, transitions was important here. Um, and we really want this in as much as all the words didn't fit to um, be a comprehensive approach to supporting children's well-being. So thinking about um, health and well-being in that broader sense as children are experiencing transition and change um, that allows for the development of that resilience and healthy brain architecture that we know they will need um, for learning behavior and health in elementary school and beyond. Um, so you can see the goals then on um, the screen really link to that vision. The first one is to create a shared understanding of transitions within and across children's early childhood years that recognizes young children and families experience many transitions and should have access to supports to help them navigate them. And so this is to just give consideration and understand what's happening within and across our communities. And um, again, what children are experiencing and how they are experiencing it. Um, the second bullet point really looks at identifying strengths and gaps in transition supports and programs across the state. Uh, so that we understand the great work that is already happening. And so we've heard from uh, many of you and certainly from these community grantees, what some of that work is and what it looks like across the state. Um, and so we wanted to be able to acknowledge that there were individuals who have already prioritized this work and we should take the time uh, to learn about what's already happening and what has been successful in those places. So we can um, give some consideration to opportunities to replicating or scaling that which is already successful. Um, and then the last goal, which really uh, kind of fits in with the others, is to ensure that all children and families are supported through transitions. Um, there are, uh, not listed on this slide, um, some strategic actions and activities that connect to each one of these goals that are embedded into that strategic plan. Um, and importantly, that strategic plan will go through um, uh, an update process uh, during 2022 <laughs> to get my years right. Um, and so over the course of the next year, that uh, Wyoming Early Childhood Strategic Plan uh, will be um, giving, will be giving some updates. So what progress have we made in this way? And then if, are there any updates asking for stakeholders to update, help us update and align <clears throat> the work of that strategic plan as it relates to the coming years. So this is a, a starting place for this work around transitions that identifies that um, vision and some of the strategic activities that we know we would like to carry out as a state. Um, related to some of that, um, we have further honed what some of this transition work looks like. And so as we started to build relationships and look at um, the evidence and consider how to approach this work, um, the approach also said, okay, as a state, what can Wyoming do to really move the needle in this area um, of transitions and with a focus on that transition into kindergarten? 
And so we are developing now the Wyoming Transitions Framework that has three key activities within it. And so I'll just note that a framework and what we consider this to be is an essential supporting structure. So what are those key supports in the structure that can help guide this work at the community and the state level um, to build some traction and, and really move on this momentum that we have now around transitions. And this framework, um, each of these activities really acknowledges that this work in transitions is complex uh, and that there are many parts that are connected, dynamic, but also ever-changing. And so if we look at each one of those activities, um, the first to strengthen coordination and partnerships, which is where we believe that a lot of this work begins. Um, and again, if you consider that vision, uh, I would just suggest that we're thinking about how communities in the state will ensure that all children have access to the um, supports that are necessary for that seamless transition. So this isn't um, a judgment of what you're doing at your own program level or you as an individual to support um, children or families or families who may be taking great efforts to support um, children as they transition. But this really is to think more at a systems level about how we are building out um, strengthening coordination and partnerships uh, within and across that system. So uh, at the in the evidence that Nikki will speak about, um, we just know and intuitively we know that transitions requires relationships and deep connections. And so this, this first activity really um, honors that. We would further suggest that um, that coordination and partnership requires equal voices across relationships. And so um, we could ask you who holds most of the power in transitions, especially that transition to kindergarten right now. We might not say that those are equal voices. And so part of this is to, to recognize and value all of the adults who are coming to the table to support children um, as they transition and to give every one of those adults uh, a voice and a role in, in making this transition successful. Uh, we also want to have that focus on equity. And so we uh, certainly with the effects of COVID-19 recognize that we need to give consideration to how um, children from low income communities, children experiencing homelessness, children um, experiencing adversity, trauma and chronic stress are transitioning. And then um, children who historically have been um, need additional experiences as they transition. So children with disabilities and children who are dual language learners. Um, and so really thinking about some of the, the populations who benefit um, from additional supports and a particular focus as we consider this transitions work. So um, that those relationships we want um, to be equal and then also to consider which individuals might benefit from some tailored and unique support. Uh, again, thinking about that comprehensive manner um, and how we would look uh, in this way, which means that some of those partnerships may include um, our health community and others as we think about how um, to provide comprehensive supports for children who are experiencing a transition. If we look at the second activity, um, align visions, expectations, and practice, this is where we leverage those relationships and respond together with greater intention to support all children's success. Um, and so first we have to understand that evidence base and come together with that sense of shared understanding of what it means to transition and what um, some of those practices can be for us uh, as a community. Um, so here too, we wanna understand the broader set of research that exists, but also think about the research that exists um, and the resources that we have in the state of Wyoming. And Nikki shared many of those earlier this morning. So um, here we're thinking about Wyoming's coherent path to quality, um, our new early childhood standards. We're talking about developmentally appropriate practice and universal design. Um, we're giving some consideration to how we embed what we heard from Julie and Julie yesterday on trauma responsive practice and self-care um, into this work. And so there are a lot of component parts that we have in Wyoming that can inform our transitions work. And um, there are some additional um, strategies that we can look to and resources that we can pull from otherwise as well. <clears throat> in this same activity, um, we're gonna use that research and the evidence that exists 
And we also then want to leverage our relationships to understand and adapt to children's diverse experiences prior to kindergarten. So here is where we think collectively about what children and families experience and how they experience it. Um, and within that, we want to focus and build on the strengths and create continuities. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about what that looks like in execution, um, but those are some really key tenets of that second activity. And the third one uh, to guide assessment data and resources is where we work together then to formalize that vision expectations and practice and to provide the resource, resources that are necessary um, for individuals, for educators, for families and others to believe that they can do this work. Um, and this too is where we gather information that allows our educators to build on strengths and align effective supports for children and families. Again, with that emphasis on whole child development. Um, you might say uh, based on work that you've done that there is no one entry point and that it's really hard to do one of these without also doing another. And you are correct. Um, so there isn't one entry point to this work with kindergarten transitions and each of these activities is mutually enforcing. Um, and so this is not, uh, not a straight or linear continuum. These activities really do enhance and support each other. Um, and so we want this to be that supportive structure um, from which we can provide additional guidance to individual educators, to communities, to programs and schools, um, to link and develop processes and practices that would encourage those effective and supportive uh, policies and practices for kindergarten transitions. So more to come as we continue to develop out um, this framework, but this is a, a start at what we are uh, beginning to develop out in Wyoming in a way that uh, leverages what we know has been successful and already exists in the state and then also leaves room um, for new communities, educators, and programs to identify what they could do in this space. Uh, we also are remiss if we do not acknowledge um, that family partnership is really a tenant of this work, uh, both in transitions and just across our early childhood work. So we wanted to be deliberate in our focus on families, um, on what children and families experience it and how they experience it. So um, this is one more effort where we're really coming together to be um, thoughtful about this work. And our uh, technical assistance with the Education Commission of the States allowed um, our, our team to work with Julie Poppy and our uh, technical assistance providers to develop out um, this continuum within transitions for family uh, involvement, engagement, and leadership. And so uh, this is in a, a draft form. So we share it with you now, understanding that it might change a little bit as we continue um, to do some of this work. Um, but this is really just a key component that is a part of both our family engagement um, for this work and also work across the preschool development grant. Um, and what is wonderful about uh, the continuum that you see on the screen is that we are linking it to a community tool. Um, and so the community role component that is identified on that continuum really promotes an approach to community readiness where the health and readiness of the community allows for families to be the change agents in the development of culturally specific and relevant programming. And so we believe that Wyoming communities are in a good position to support a place-based community-driven model. So that is to say that what is working in Jackson might not work in Casper, which is different than what's working in Evanston, which is different than Newcastle and so on. Um, and so the community role component um, is our, our key here. And so what we'll do um, with this continuum is link up to a community tool, as I said, that we are refining that will allow communities to dig in on some of this planning work and focus on their systems as a part of a self-assessment and reflective um, process where you can understand where your community is and compare it to the outcome that you want to achieve. So lots of great work that this is a sneak peek at what is coming uh, for communities down the road. So we're thrilled to be able to have a great start from um, our technical assistance from ECS and others 
um, and recognize that there's more work to come in this way where we're able to elevate the importance of families in this transitions work and also um, just as children's first and most important guide and teacher. Uh, then we want to talk a little bit about the Wyoming Kindergarten Transitions Grant. Um, and so this is a grant that is funded with $200,000 from the Wyoming Preschool Development Grant. The first round of grants was awarded in uh, 2021, and there is funding for 2022 and 2023. Um, so there are five community grantees at this point who were awarded um, a combination of both planning and implementation grants. So this is uh, Sublette County School District number one and the Pinedale Community, Teton County School District number one and Jackson, Lincoln County School District number two in Star Valley, Natrona County School District number one in Casper um, and Hot Springs County School District number one in Thermopolis. And in as much as I list those school districts, um, we required community uh, participation and partnership here. And so this really is looking at the broader set of individuals from early childhood and um, their counterparts in that K-12 system to really come together and do this uh, work together. And so we are thrilled to be able to offer a chance for you to hear from two of those grantees uh, this morning. Um, and so I'll save uh, a, an understanding and, and let them share out what these processes and what this support and practice has really looked like at the community level. Um, we were also able um, through our partnership with Dina and the Department of Education to link up uh, to supporting and um, participating in this summit so that we could continue um, this platform uh, and engagement with all of you and the hope that this gives us an opportunity to scale up our efforts within and across uh, what's happening in that framework and to better understand what's happening in communities beyond these five grantees or those who we may have already connected with. Um, because a part of uh, what's coming in 2022 and 2023 is using these community grants as a, a pilot and a, a base for building out and providing support to other communities around the state. Um, and although we may not be able to provide the same level of funding, we're really looking to provide the same level of support um, or resource where other communities could continue or build on work that they've already done around kindergarten transitions. Um, and so we'll be uh, looking forward to your feedback and connecting with you as we think about what's ahead in terms of the next steps for this really critical work around um, kindergarten transitions. And so I haven't heard of any questions yet that have come in. And so with all of that said, I am happy to turn it over to Nikki um, to talk a little bit more about the evidence base for transitions and why that is so critical um, as we consider this community and state level work. Thanks, Becca. Um, I may end up having to change rooms in just a minute. They decided to come lay my carpet right now during this presentation. So I'd like to apologize for everyone. Um, but we'll see how we do. If, if it's okay, I'm gonna go with it. I wanna share my screen again. Um, and let's talk about the evidence base. Becca made reference to it. Um, basically all the choices that Becca's talking about that have been made to try to support how communities support transitions, they all come from this really strong evidence base about transitions. And there's a lot more to that evidence base than what I'm sharing today. But I think there are just some key pieces that we would just wanna forefront before we hear from our friends um, in Afton and Jackson today. So let's just talk about just a little bit of the background. Um, here's some things that we just have to know first, and that is that any time there's a transition, it impacts children. Um, and here's some of the pieces that are frequently impacted and certainly impacted in kindergarten. Um, when children enter a new space with new people um, and new experiences, there's changes in how they understand their identity there's changes in their relationships. And this leads to pretty consistently some uncertainty. And depending on the transition, it can lead to a great deal of stress. And when you think about sort of that triangle of the things, child identity, their relationships, and then their level of stress, think about how those three things combine to impact those things that, that are in the center here, which are uh, their confidence, their self feelings of self-efficacy, their behavior, their performance, and their learning. So if you think about 
all those things are impacted during transitions. And when you're talking about a transition related to schooling, think about how that imp impacts everything that kids are gonna experience and produce for us in a school setting. Um, just a couple of quotes that I really love that I wanted to share. A calm, regulated child can respond to uncertainty with curiosity and interest, wondering what will happen next and feeling ready for it. For a child who is already anxious, uncertainty may trigger increased amygdala activity and shut down other cognitive processes, like the urge to investigate or experiment, because the uncertainty seems to pose too much of a threat to allow new learning. These are things that the Julies talk about constantly. When we're talking about new learning, uh, we just can't disregard understanding where kids are coming from. Um, here's the happy news about transitions. When they're supported by adults that know how to do it well and are really intentional, transitions actually can be a trigger for development and learning. You all have seen it. A child has a new experience and they're well supported in it and suddenly they have this new skill set that emerges from it and it's really, really beautiful. Um, it also, transitions can allow children to demonstrate and practice becoming more confident. Um, oh, this is a bad sign. Um, yep, I got to change rooms. I'm going to keep going while I change rooms. Um, they are also then, as a result, able to build resilience, resourcefulness, and collaboration. Um, one of the things we want to talk about, though, so there's those, po there's those positive pieces of transitions that are excellent. Um, there are some things, though, that can really become a struggle. And that's where we want to spend some time talking today is how we can support kids to avoid that struggle or to help carry that burden. So one of the things I think has been most compelling that, ha that um, exists in the research is sort of thinking about what's called the burden of change. And anytime a child's going through, anytime any of us are going through a transition, somebody is carrying the burden of changing throughout that transition the most. And what the research has shown is when we're talking about the transition to kindergarten um, and transitions in children's life, often the truth is that children end up carrying that burden of change more than anyone else. And if you think about the adults that are involved in supporting transitions and um, the maturity with which adults can respond to those things, um, it doesn't seem right that the least experienced participants in a transition are being asked to change the most. So we really wanna rethink that. We wanna to try to share the burden of change. Um, here's another great quote that I just love. Uh, Transitions often involve changes for children that none of their previous experiences could have prepared them for. This is certainly the case with the transition to kindergarten. They've never been there before. This is particularly true though, when there's a gap between children's social, cultural, and linguistic experiences at home and the expectations placed upon them in the new setting. So is it reasonable for us as adults to expect that children will make the majority of changes? And we wanna be thinking about how we can accept greater responsibility and help children carry that burden of change. I wanna think again, I really want us all to think about um, that, that statement in the middle of that quote there, that when there's a gap between children's social, cultural, and linguistic experiences at home and the expectations placed upon them in the new setting, that's where the biggest challenge arises for children. So the bigger the transition, the bigger the burden of change. And then the bigger the burden of change, the more help children are going to need to carry it. So who's gonna help them carry that? That's what we're here for. That's what the adults in their lives are for. And that's what communities are here for and schools and early childhood programs are here. So these are the things, this is like a quick summary of the data. These are the things that we know are linked to successful transitions. So first of all, thinking about settings, kids are more successful in transitions when there are similarities between the settings, when there's communication between the settings that's bi-directional, goes both ways, when there's supportive links between the settings, when there's uh, interest in the child and family's background and experiences, that between settings, the transition goes better. And when there, the degree of match between the expectations in the new setting and how children think and learn what we know about them. Uh, when those things are there, transitions are more successful. Now that relationship piece, what's the data telling us about that? 
Um, mostly that if children are experiencing a sense of belonging, their transition is more successful. If they have access to warm, affectionate, and attuned responses from adults. Um, if there's if the child and family have a connection to a key adult, really interesting uh, research that shows what an impact that that has in the transition. If a child has a friend in a new setting and um, what parents' attitudes are about the transition have a really big impact on the success of the child in that transition. And then I'm gonna include these sort of under the category of agency. Um, what the research is showing us is that Children that have opportunities to engage in open-ended learning have more experience more successful transitions into in learning settings. Children's feelings of confidence, making choices for themselves, their sense of control over their environment. Um, that should harken back to the things that Julie said to us yesterday. Um, their opportunities for collaboration and problem solving are really important. And then children's ability, young children's ability to use play as a tool to make sense of the things that are happening to them. Um, is really important in impacting a successful transition. Um, so that's that's what's out there. And we wanna be thinking about what that means for all of us now. A couple of things that are really useful and helpful is um, thinking about transitions from a developmental perspective. So um, in the research, we're gonna go back. In the research, whoa, let me try that again. In the research, uh, they talk about it as a developmental model of transitions. And the way that's defined is when we think about transitions as occurring over time, not just as a single one-time event. Another principle in the developmental model of transitions is that they should be supported then during, before, during, and after like the actual moment of change. And then another really key piece that we all need to be thinking about is that everybody that's involved in a transition is impacted by it. And not only are they impacted by the transition, but they actually influence its success. So we just take a minute and even think about that. Who all is involved in the transition to kindergarten in a child's life? Those people are being impacted by that transition and they are also exerting a really significant influence on its success. Another concept that Beck Am I unmuted now? Wait. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Sorry, I think it was, okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, so is the idea of continuity versus discontinuity. So what we know is that children need continuity and connectedness and consistency. They need that always in order to learn and thrive. So what are the things that are in danger in a transition? Those pieces. So. Transitions do threaten continuity for kids. They also threaten connectedness and consistency. So then what we want to be focusing on is how we can maintain continuity during a transition. And here's just some examples uh, that, that were mentioned before is the degree to which the two settings are related to each other are similar. That builds in continuity for a child. And the extent to which the new experiences connect with a child and family's background and experiences that builds in that incredible support of continuity for a child. Um, so if we wanna be thinking about the transition to kindergarten specifically, um, then let's just, let's just talk about what makes that transition special. We care about supporting children through all transitions. And the things that I shared the evidence there, that's that's about all transitions. That's what we know supports children's success across all transitions. But the transition to kindergarten is significant and important because it's such a significant life event for a child and a family and for a community actually, um, that it deserves special attention. And let's just, you all know this, um, but let's just think about how big that transition is to kindergarten. And just the first piece, just. Just think for a minute about the difference in the settings. Child who's been in childcare, a child who's never been in childcare or in preschool, um, whatever a child's previous experiences before, what was their setting maybe like? Here's some examples. So just think of physical differences alone that children experience. The size of their surroundings changes dramatically. Um, the number of people that they're around changes dramatically. The size of the people that they're around changes dramatically. 
socially, mm -hmm. think about what's different in those settings when you enter the school setting. Primarily their social world is going to expand dramatically. It will become more complex. There are different social networks that are gonna be developed, different friendships, a different set of identities. Just think about a child who's transitioning. Let's say they uh, are the oldest child at home. They have a younger sibling. They haven't had the opportunity to be in preschool um, and they've just been the big kid. And then they're gonna enter a world where there's a lot more people and they're no longer the biggest. Think about that for a child who's been in a preschool classroom where they got to be the big kid. Um, what it means, you all have experienced this, right? What it means to go from being uh, the top of the heap to once again being a novice and not knowing what's going on and, and just how that alone can impact the experience of the transition. And then let's just talk about the difference in philosophy in settings. There's very different approaches. We are trying really hard to link these together, but currently there can be very different approaches to learning and teaching. And uh, what's prioritized and how time is spent is certainly different when a child enters school. And then if you just think about the kind of support that children receive, um, it's just, th it's the nature of it. Um, schools don't have the same amount of, of adults available. And so generally speaking, children are giving, given less individual attention, certainly, and less one-on-one -on -one support during routines and learning opportunities. And then let's just talk about expectations. Here's just some examples of differences in expectations. Uh, there are certainly different academic demands. The way children are grouped changes much different and how they're expected to be grouped and how they're expected to behave and manage themselves within a group. Uh, Self-care routines, the things that they do to get through the day, that certainly changes. And I think and everybody here that knows kids or knows a kid would recognize that often that's one of the biggest stressors, finding out where the new restroom is, figuring out how to do lunchtime. Uh, those things can be so stressful for kids in the transition to kindergarten. Understanding changes in rules and reward systems. Frequently, children, when they enter a school system, are newly exposed to like complex reward systems and tracking systems for behavior that they've never experienced before. An understanding of rules is different. Um, just think about the experience of arrival and departure, um, what that's like for children in a new setting what the expectations are for their independence, their ability to do meet their own needs, that changes dramatically. Um, just how they're communicated to. Uh, primarily now, a lot of communication happens in two groups, not individual children in school settings, because there's bigger groups of children and fewer adults. So it's just naturally gonna happen that way, but how they're communicated to. And, um, and if communication is both ways, often it's an adjustment for kindergartners because there's been more time for someone to listen to them and respond to them. And there's sometimes can be less time for that in a school setting. And so communication, uh, if we're not careful, can be really one directional to children in a school setting with not a lot of opportunity for them to respond. Uh, just the way things are organized and how they have to keep themselves organized is much different. And then all of this fits into this idea of self-regulation and executive function skills that are required to be successful in that kind of setting. So then this is the big piece. We want to help carry that burden of change. And so what is it that communities can do? Um, and I think what I'd like to do is just take a minute and have you guys type into the chat, just given all those things that I just shared, what do you think communities should do to support children in that transition? And then we'll talk about, we'll offer some, some suggestions, but you already know a lot about this. So let's just hear in the chat, what do we need to do to carry that burden of change, to help carry that burden of change a little bit for kids? Okay, there are some things coming in. 
summer programs. Very nice, yeah. Stronger organizations and communities. Open days when they could come in and explore the school. Thanks. Uh, organizations meeting to discuss transitions and dates and all of those things. It's great. Collaboration. Ah, uh, in one school, they do pre-K, not sure what TK is, and kindergarten all work together to dismiss. Visits, conversations, pointing out new friends, summer programs, stronger child care, preschool, early intervention coalitions, collaboration, better relationships. Kindergarten visits is something that Melody offered and public school holds kindergarten readiness activities. Yeah, be willing to include adults and the need to have social emotional skills and supports. Parent learning opportunities. Thanks, Michelle. Great, Kelsey, creating an environment where they, their families, the culture and languages are represented and honored. Um, Stephanie, collaborations between early childhood, kindergarten district families to better understand and support this transition. Combined parent groups, love that idea. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are out there. And I think uh, Becca can speak to this as well, but one of the things we're really trying to do as we address transitions is there's just like a lot of great ideas and brainstorms. And we want people to be able to access their own collective ideas for their own community and their own space to help support this. And at the same time, there are some things we do just know. So we want to be able to offer communities. So it's more than just a brainstorm session, that it's a brainstorm based on evidence. Um, let's think of some other things we can do to address gaps, things that we might be missing to better support this transition. And so that's what I'm going to offer next. Just so what the evidence is showing us that we want to be thinking about specifically to in this in this brainstorming piece about how we can better support children. There's some more great stuff happening in the chat from Dina and Amy and Jen. Um, so be sure to check that out. I'll just share again and let's come back to this piece about what communities can do. So I've broken it down into, into three pieces. First is schools. Now, when I say schools, I don't just mean um, public school, but just in general educational organizations. So preschools uh, or anybody that's engaged in trying to teach kids some skills, what can they do? And then of course this is, some of this is really about school districts too, but I just want school district employees here to know that are on this call, it, the burden isn't all on you, but we definitely wanna share in that burden of change. So I think this is key. I don't, we can't even question this anymore in early childhood or maybe in anything anymore since COVID. Relationships are the most important thing. Um, and often that's the thing that takes the back seat because we have so many other things we're concerned about in that transition, but we need to just step up and know and state that relationship building is the most important priority to help support kids transition to kindergarten. And how that can happen, that can happen in a million different ways that can be specific to your community. This one's really key as well. We need to support teachers' abilities to make decisions and respond flexibly to children's needs with young children specifically and with young children experiencing a transition. And in particular with young children experiencing a transition where there's a gap between their experiences in their life and what's happening in that setting. Let's just think about all those pieces the thing that has to happen for them is they need an adult who can respond flexibly and make decisions based on their individual needs. So the days of us embracing teaching that's teacher proof where you just read from a script and all teachers do the exact same thing with young children, those days need to be gone if they're not yet, because that's not a developmentally appropriate practice for young children. I care a lot about fidelity. But we, what's more important to make sure young children succeed in a transition is adults that are in tune and teachers that use their expertise and knowledge of the children in their classrooms. They have it. Kindergarten teachers need the opportunity to make decisions and respond flexibly to the children in their classroom. And I see it all the time in schools. It does happen in our state. And things go so well when teachers are given that power. 
Uh, we need to increase communication gathering to support planning for environments and instruction. And I think that's one of the places we go when we brainstorm. We got to get more information about these kids. That's that's true. We do want more information. We also want to gather information, um, not for the purpose of grouping, but for the purpose of planning our environments so that there's a link between kids' experiences and what's happening in our environments and so that there's a link between children's experiences and what our instructional strategies to teach them. When that link is there, that's when their brains can create those neural pathways that are linked to previous knowledge and experiences. When there's a huge gap between what kids are learning about and how they're learning and what their environment is like and anything else they've experienced before, that's when children struggle. And the, the burden should be on us as adults to make that change and not children in that setting. Uh, then, of course, one thing that's easy, we can just know this as a truth now. We want to think about transitions developmentally. So we want to think about supporting them before, during, and after that first day of kindergarten. So go ahead, brainstorm in your communities how you can make that happen. There's a lot of different ways that can happen. We also, we also really need to ensure that everyone involved in that transition understands the science of early learning. I use this example frequently, but um, I think it's just really important to think about if if we are trying to uh, decrease incidence of cancer in a community, let's say a bunch of really well-meaning people in a community want to try to help decrease the incidence of cancer. Um, what we probably would not do is just bring them all together for a little brainstorm. Uh, hey, you're not a medical professional, but what do you think we should do? Oh, hey, librarian, what do you think we should do? Let's just all sit down and brainstorm what we think we should do. I think what we would start with first is we would bring in medical professionals that know some things about cancer and we would learn something about that from them and then turn on the brainstorm session, knowing these things that we know about cancer and cancer prevention, what can we do in our community? But we would never start that conversation absent the expertise. And so let's do the same in transitions in early childhood. Let's make sure that anyone that's talking about a transition understands the science of early learning and then turn them loose and let's have a great brainstorm session. And then this is really important. And we talked about this with standards. Um, there are tools available that are just right there for us that we can embrace. The people th that have the expertise have done the work. They've done the work for years, years and years and years. And they know the things that are needed for kids. Let's embrace them. We've got trauma responsive teaching. Uh, we're splashing that all over this state with the Julies right now, please pay attention to what they're teaching us about that. We know what universal design for learning is. We can embrace that in our schools and developmentally appropriate practice. There's a new incredible volume that you can win that Dina talked about today. And if you want a copy of it, you contact your professional learning facilitator, the professional learning collaborative, and we will get a copy in your hands. The new developmentally mentally appropriate practice book, that's where the foundational pieces of knowledge are. Embrace those things. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can embrace what's already there. And then this one um, is, is another one that's just kind of an easy win. Let's just create links across those settings. So we can think about how that happens in a lot of different ways, but let's just make sure that one of our priorities is creating and strengthening links across those settings. So that's the piece for schools. Let's talk about what we can do for families. Um, we can help families understand the science of early learning and development so that um, they can understand what their children are experiencing as they respond to their environment. Um, we can make that the foundation of the ways that we communicate about children. And I can't wait for Teton County to talk about some ways that they have done that. Um, I think we know that there can be more time spent on getting to know families and um, to be able to use that knowledge about families to bring the learning experiences we're offering children closer to the child and their experiences. We got to shrink that gap between the child's experiences and what we're asking them to do in that setting. And the best way to know how to shrink it is to understand more about them and their families. Becca talked about that and she talked about this piece as well. The best way to do that is to identify, that's a lot of hammering, to identify family strengths and build upon them. So um, strength-based work with families is supported in all the evidence as the most powerful way to impact families and children and their learning. We wanna start from strengths. We wanna think about their funds of knowledge. We start there, start with the family and build upon it. Um, and then it's really important for us to find ways to identify and decrease family stress. This is one of those things where, you know, we used to think that 
that maybe that wasn't school's responsibilities. We're just focused on learning. But the truth is that we know that all learning occurs based on a child's ability to take it in. And their ability to take it in is based on their level of stress or calm that they're experiencing. There's no way to separate that from a child's learning. So now we know that it's everybody's job in a community to help decrease families' levels of stress so that children can do this hard work that they're being asked to do to transition. Uh, we just need to work on building relationships, as I said before, with families. It's fantastic to do parent-teacher conferences in a welcome night, but there's more. There's more that we all can do. And um, so let's start brainstorming ways we can make that happen in our communities. Um, and then this one's really key. And I've experienced this in my time anecdotally in that transition to kindergarten, but um, there's so much more that happens in that transition in kindergarten in families, in their homes, as they have to change their lives to meet the new needs. So we need to, let's just forefront that and let's support that. One of the best things we ever did at the Early Care and Education Center here at the university was to create a, a parent night, a transition night that was not even, that no teacher spoke at all. And parents just talked to other parents about the things that they experienced. So there were a lot of conversations about how you better have a snack in the car when you pick the kid up after school because they're not going to make it home. Conversations about it's a really good idea to practice eating a little bit faster because their child struggled with that. Conversations about how much sleep they need, conversations about all these other things. And um, instead of that just being like a family's experience that's that they experience alone or separate from the rest of us adults supporting that transition, let's just bring that experience in and support it intentionally. And then this is really key. We need to connect families to each other. And Becca talked about that as well. We want to be building a school community and one way to do that is to provide opportunities for families to support each other. And then one other piece, we just want to be thinking about children and their experiences. And so what are the things we know? Shocking. We're going to focus on relationship building. It needs to be the first thing. And between children and adults, certainly, but between children and other children, we saw it's crazy, but it's really salient in the evidence that if children have a friend, their transition goes more smoothly. What could, what if we focused on helping children make a friend the first week of school? I wonder how much difference that would make if we shifted a little bit of our focus that way. Um, recognize and embrace play as children's most essential meaning making tool. We have to know that that is the way that young children make sense of what's happening around them. That is their primary tool for learning. We do want to talk about how we can make learning experiences more playful for children, but in general, don't ignore what's happening at recess. Help people make sense of how children are playing at home after school. How can we understand and embrace play as not only essential for children to have the opportunity to do, but a way for us to learn by observing them in their play. We can learn a ton about where children are at in that transition by just paying attention. Um, we need to increase their children's, the, Julie's talked about it yesterday, when we need to feel in control. When we lack a feeling of control, that's when that stress response system kicks in. So we need to increase children's opportunities to make decisions and to experience self-mastery. So uh, how can we give them opportunities to make choices? That is one magical thing about playful learning or learning where children can make choices as they feel that sense of control, their anxiety is reduced and then their ability to learn is increased. We want to give attention to and support the daily transitions like during, so there's that transition first day of kindergarten, but there's a million transitions during the kindergarten day. And let's more intentionally support those transitions using the same things, the same principles that we're talking about here. And then transitions throughout the year, what happens through a school year? Let's think about that as well. Um, and this one's key. I can't stress this enough. We want to create, and I, I just want to really focus in on the assessment piece of this, but learning environments and assessment that decrease children's stress response so that it can allow us to see what they can do. When we're under stress, we don't show the things we know and can do. And if you think about when we choose to assess children, we do kindergarten screenings in a brand new environment with a brand new adult that they've never met. Um, and just that decision alone means we're not going to see what children can truly do and what they truly know. And I know that's tricky. We got to find a way to, you know, know where kids are at when they come in. How can we create assessment environments that decrease that response? So we can't make it perfect, but how can we make it better? 
Um, and then we have to find ways that we're bringing our instruction closer to children. So that gap between what expectations are and where children are, the burden of filling that gap is on the adults, not the child. And then this piece is great. We can do this in our communities. We can think about the whole child, the whole child, not a discrete set of skills or how they decode. We want to think about the child and their membership in a community, their family in the community. And then that's where the power lies is in that piece. So that's why we're doing this community's work, because we know that once a community is activated in helping this improve for children, that's where the magic happens. And that's why I'm so excited to share next. Um, we're going to introduce our friends. Uh, from Teton County and from Lincoln County to talk a little bit about what they've been doing. And I love that they're both here. They've written for the grant and Becca can have a chance to introduce and talk about them a little as well. Um, but they're doing different things. They're doing different kind of work. But I think what you'll see as you listen to them talk is that they're embracing the things that the evidence is showing us and they're doing it in a way that fits well in their communities. Um, so what I think, Britt, you're on. I see you're here from Teton County. Um, we're going to let you go first and talk to everybody a little bit about what you guys have been up to there. Super. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, oh, my gosh, it's fun to actually recognize faces because we've been fortunate to be on these Zooms together with all of this wonderful information from Becca and Nikki and, and each other. Um, should I share my screen, Nikki, or do you? That would be great. Uh, you, you should be able to. Dina, I think, made it so you can. I haven't done this in a little while, so here we go. Okay. Okay, all good? Sorry, should have had it. That's okay, it's coming. Going. Okay. Uh-oh, do I have to do that, present to a meeting code, or just present? I think you can just present. I'll come up. Okay, there we go. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. Okay. So this is a tiny bit awkward because Alex Go, who is our wonderful kindergarten transi transition coordinator in Teton County School District and also um, started our Grizzlies and Cubs um, pre-K for employees, actually put this together um, and I added one slide. So I'll do my best. Um, to talk about all the things she has coordinated. She and I both wrote a grant the first year and the second year. Um, we kind of combined our grant, but what happened first was that um, we reimagined re our kindergarten roundup um, to move to a uh, closer, closer to the start of school. So where it used to be in May, uh, we now see these incoming kindergarten kids in um, August. And I think this has been really helpful in actually um, seeing where kids truly are as we talk about how to um, best help their transition and, and teach them. Um, it's, it was, it's been a family friendly event, less um, stressful where you drop your kid off and you know say goodbye. We kind of um, give a school tour, even during COVID times, um, you know, we met on the playground and talked with masks on. Um, so parents felt welcomed and, and they could speak with other school personnel outside while their children were brought inside and they were given a quick introduction of what would be done um, with their children. Oh my gosh, I'm really not experienced. I'm sorry. It's been a while since virtual learning for me. Uh, and then the screener included more hands-on activities like bracelet making for counting and patterning, patterning and um, self-portrait uh, drawing to assess fine motor skills and you know self-concept. Um, they're hung up in the classrooms for the first day of school, so the kids would recognize themselves and each other and um, feel welcomed as they came in. And then there was playground observation time, so that you know it, it was. Um, really free play that we got to see. And um, then the teachers used the screener data to inform the class lists. Um, but it was just kind of a more free form, holistic experience, but still guided by, you know, what teachers wanted to see and know about the kids. Um, this year, uh, Alex did a kinder preschool pen pal program, and these are the lovely baskets that she put together to take to uh, local preschools and um, eight kindergarten classrooms and eight preschool classrooms partnered 
Um, they got these baskets and then did some authentic writing to communicate um, and develop relationships for these incoming pre-K kids. And then hopefully we're going to do a springtime outdoor visit to actually um, let the, the pre-K children meet the um, kindergarten children and see the classrooms. Fingers crossed on that. Um, the home readiness kits. We did some of this sort of almost like a knee jerk to COVID um, last year and, and sent home learning kits to kids who are, you know, who are on quarantine or isolation um, or home for any other reasons or just simply might need supplementing at home uh, with materials. But Alex was very smart in having this be um, a more official pilot program where she partnered with Teton Literacy Center um, so that we could actually monitor kind of the feedback um, and the effectiveness of these home learning kits because our, our literacy center here has very close um, family relationships and um, you know they're in constant communication and families welcomed in to observe lessons so that there's you know a generalization from home to school and back again. Um, so it was 27 kits with a focus on fine motor development, early alphabet introduction um, with Play-Doh, journals, crayons, activity book, everything you see there. Um, and then the key part I think that was so cool was some family friendly ideas and activities to try at home with the materials. I think there was some translation available there for um, you know, English language learners or other language speakers. And then um, the preschool teachers, yes, they did introduce the kits at parent night and went over the activities. Um, and then they're going to gather feedback from the families um, via a survey, uh, you know, to see what the families thought and if there was anything that was uh, missing. And we're going to try a mathematics themed home learning kit in the spring. Uh, based on some of the input. Um, here's a little video uh, we can show that the kindergartner, kindergarten teachers in um, two of our elementary schools at least, and a, and a third is starting to try this on. Um, the, the play labs have been incredible. And um, sorry, my daughter's signing me. Um, Kindergartner teachers and preschool providers have come together to learn about incorporating play, um, thanks to our PDs led by Dr. Nikki Baldwin. And they've um, covered learning through play and um, um, very closely connecting this play um, very sneakily in um, the standards and curriculum and then documenting learning. So here's a sneak peek with the um, Pet Vet Dramatic Play Center. Whoops. So they have to sign in their pet. Okay, um, let me minimize this. Okay, um, and I just got rid of the slideshow. I'm so sorry, um, but I think what you saw there was tons of um, engagement and there was more collaboration, um, more kids, you know, playing together rather than just parallel play. Um, and then there's one final slide I can get back to. If I can stop this, there we go. Sorry, my computer is running very slowly. Do you have questions while I'm doing this? Maybe I'll just talk a little bit, Britt, about that, yeah, go. that play piece in case anyone's interested. 
Yeah. Uh, um, but one of the things we're uh, doing in Teton County is um, yeah, they have devoted time during professional development days for their kindergarten and first grade teams to talk a little bit about brainstorming, how to get some more playful learning experiences in the classroom. Um, we've been doing this over the course of two years. And um, a model that's been adopted in both Afton and Jackson is uh, some of the schools is they're trying out a place called a play lab that's shared across kindergartens and how we're linking that to classroom learning. If anybody else that's on this call has any interest in that, please, please let me know um, because there's support for you to be able to access materials for that. And there's training and support that we can do for you if you have some interest in it. But some really exciting things are happening in those spaces as a part of that as well. So, And our community is just wonderful, as, as you can see, about donating um, really authentic materials. We got things from several vet clinics. Oops. Next. Okay. Um, goodness gracious. So sorry. Um, kindergarten exemption meetings. We have a cutoff date for kindergarten. It has changed from September 15th to August 1st um, for this school year. Um, last spring, we began the exemption meetings for families whose child's birth date falls between August 1st and, 1st and September 15th and whose parents were interested in enrolling in kindergarten. The meetings included family, K teachers, um, administrators, and preschool teachers and focused on kindergarten readiness and expectations. The goal was to build relationships early and support families in making the best and most informed decision regarding their child and kindergarten enrollment. Um, and I think this has just helped forge, you know, conversations um, about what parents can expect with kindergarten and what teachers expect with incoming children or the kinds of learning that will happen. Um, finally, looking ahead, we have, again, those Literacy Center math home kits. Um, hopefully we'll do a summer kinder transition fair in order to, um, again, collaborate with parents and have them be able to be the voice of um, kind of voicing their concerns and questions and have people on hand to help them with that. And then we have also been sending home to our kindergartners, and this will hopefully transition to pre-K children, language development ideas um, to use at home. I can link that if anybody's interested, but it was from our speech and language teacher, um, because we all know that oracy is, is a prime indicator of success in school and literacy and future life. So trying to make this quick. Any questions there? Britt, did Alex include the um, the video, the kinder ambassador video? <gasps> no. I think I'm I think I'll pull that up really okay. quickly if anyone has a question. It's kind of a fun one too that uh, I think has a good good lens on how to approach some of this. Nice. Um, yeah, overall, I just think we have all learned so much um, and changed our practices and it's having a ripple effect. Okay, I am going to make sure that I am sharing my audio too here. I think this will work. Let's try this. No audio, Becca. But when you screen share, if you go back to sharing your screen again, you can click optimize. There's like a box below. So, you, oh, yeah, there it is. Here. Yep. Okay. Okay. Let's try it again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Coulter. Hi, I'm Zari. Hi, I'm Ethan. Hi, I'm Julia. Come on, follow us to our classroom. Welcome to school today. We're so glad you're here. Good morning. What you do when you 
come in from your home, you put your backpack on a hanger and your coat, and then you can put your shoes here or your boots if you want to change into your tennis shoes. Every morning we do morning reading. It's a fun way to start the morning. Let's talk about today. Today we're about to go to picture day. And then we have a pretty awesome normal morning. We're going to have um, calendar, recess, reading groups, and then it'll be time for lunch. And then we, remember we have double specials today. So first, where do we go? Art. Art. Second, where do we go? Music. Music. It's our last day of music for the week. Every day we have a calendar. It's the 21st of May, May 21st. Were you here Saturday when it was really kind of nice but really, really windy? No. Four. Here's a hard question. How many more sunny than cloudy? One, two, three, four, okay. five, six, seven. During reading groups, we do games, we do reading, and we do writing. Say, what's up, title page? What's up, title page? Okay, here's the dedication for my sister, Kristen. One hundred and fifty-four. Can you guys say it? Nice job. We have big bathrooms here at school. Listen to your body. We eat lunch in the lunch room. Every day we go outside and recess. Life cycle. How many more days to hatch day? Five! So there's two hatching. Hey, Diana. They're brown and striped. That's a fact. It's okay. It's okay. They're going to go from all the stages. We didn't see the egg, right? Say good luck with your life. Hello. Good luck with your life. Thank you for growing with us. He might want to go on you. Oh. Yeah. Every day we have specials. Eyes on me. Nice. Now this is how we live around the school. Texture is the way something feels. You are going to use texture rubbing plates. Okay, everybody find your paint and wake up the colors. Music! Three, one, two, three. Chicken, 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 chicken. If you ever find yourself lost in the dark and you can't see,
My favorite thing to do in kindergarten is learn a math. My favorite thing to do is dress up and play with my friends. My favorite thing to do at kindergarten is eat pizza. My favorite thing to do in school is reading books. My favorite part about kindergarten is learning about math and shapes. My favorite thing to do at school is writing Letters to our pen pals. My favorite part about kindergarten is reading because I like to look at the pictures. My favorite thing at doing at school is doing a lot of math. The thing of of school is I go into my class and I do fun things. It's time to go home. We go home in different ways. We look forward to seeing you at one of our elementary schools this fall. Jackson Elementary, Wilson Elementary, Moland Elementary, Coulter Elementary, Kelly Elementary, Mungo Mountain, Alta Elementary. See you in the fall! So we see a lot of <clears throat> comments in the chat about that. I don't know, Britt, if there's anything else you wanna add, um, but thanks for taking a few minutes to watch that. We love it. I'm sure that Alex would be willing to share if anybody needed an example, I can be in touch with her and just send me an email. I left it there in the chat if anyone's interested. Yeah, and Nikki and I are, happy to to make introductions to Alex too if that's easier than you fielding them Britt so thank you hey Britt I don't know if you're planning to talk about this but will you share a little bit about the parent nights the one oh, you yes. just asked me to speak I because this is another really creative idea you all have come up with that I'd love for people to hear yeah sorry I forgot about that um that's okay last year uh we work together as a kindergarten team at Coulter Elementary School to put together a series of parent conversations um, that could help parents with um, specific information about kindergarten and kindergartners. And we met about once a month from 6.30 to seven. And the themes ranged from, Nikki started us off with child development. So, people, especially new parents, would kind of understand what typical um, kindergartners do and um, what they're like. And, um, you know, of course, kind of have a way in on, um, on those developmental milestones in sort of a, an outside 
surreptitious sort of way. Um, and then we would, we progressed into literacy, numeracy, um, executive function by our school counselor, um, kind of um, movement and um, coordination from our PE teacher. Um, what else? we had a number of themes and topics, um, you know, just how parents could support kids at home. Uh, also using Nikki's play-based ideas and language development ideas um, so that parents had an opportunity to ask questions about that and, and hear about, you know, current practices and research. Um, they were pretty successful. I think we had typically 14 to 20 parents across three kinder classes. Um, attend each event and they were um, starting to participate a whole lot more toward the end of the year. So I think it was it was nice that we did more than just one because parents actually started to um, really engage in conversation rather whether you know in the chats or verbally and lots of times they would even attend with their children. So um, we're looking to start that up again at Jackson Elementary School this year. And they're all via Zoom. At some point, we hope to go live with them. Thanks, Britt. I, mm -hmm. I love that example because it's one of those long-term, it's the developmental understanding of transitions. Continual parent meetings through the course of, a, of the year is really, really nice support that you all came up with. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, something and just Oh, oh I, I just want to add too that, that that also provides those social connections for families, connecting families yeah. to families and maintaining those ongoing relationships. So I, there are multiple benefits that we could speak about. And so those are a couple of the ones that, that come to the forefront. Yes, yeah. and we had a uh, um, Spanish speaker as well. And we had a separate breakout room and the same presentation given in Spanish. Thanks, Britt. Um, somebody did just type in the chat a question about the PD uh, that I did. I design PD to fit the needs of schools. So um, the, what I've done in different districts is different. So uh, Nicole, um, I could talk to, I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested, your administrator or anyone else about what's available, but it's really um, based on teachers and their interests and what it is that they want to try to do in their practice. Um, and then we sort of shape it around that. So thanks. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, we will be in touch with you for sure. There's a group of us sitting here that would love to talk more and we're in Hot Springs County. Hot Springs. Great. Get a hold of me. Thank you. you bet. Okay. And then I'm really excited for, to share the work that's been happening um, in Lincoln County. They're in Star Valley and have Shar and Emily share a little bit about this. So they're in a, this is a good example of sort of the different stages that people are at in this process of thinking about transition in the community. And what they've been doing in their county is more planning grant work that's been happening this fall. So we really am excited for you to share or to hear uh, what it's like to try to approach this from a planning sort of lens. So we'll, I will let you have the floor, Shar and Emily. You guys introduce yourselves too, to all of us. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. And there we go. Okay. So um, Emily and I are really excited to be with you. I will let her introduce herself in just a second. Um, but I'm Char Norris. Um, I am the Southwest um, Early Childhood Professional Learning Facilitator um, for the Early Childhood Professional Learning Collaboration and or collaborative, sorry. And I'm I've been able to work with Emily um, in this endeavor. So go ahead, Emily. Um, okay, I am Emily Isaacson. I live in Star Valley. Um, I'm the Family and Community Outreach Coordinator for Lincoln County School District Number Two here. Um, <clears throat> I think um, if you want to go to the next slide, Becca, I'll just. The work that I do as the Family and Community Outreach Coordinator is I've tried in the past to work with um, some with the preschool, kinder, um, child care administrators. I, I try to work with all of them and 
with the administrator team that I work with, we've had uh, several conversations about uh, how we can further this uh, early childhood work in our community and especially how we can uh, better the transition into kindergarten and the school setting uh, for those kindergartners and their families. Um, so the work that we've already had in place uh, was is we have an early childhood coalition that has been in place for several years here, uh, where several different organizations throughout the community work with each other just kind of trying to coordinate uh, different things like the libraries, the public health, WIC, uh, just so that we know who we are and what resources are available in the community as we work with different families. We, the local child development centers offer free development screenings. They, the child development centers also work with the kindergarten teams to discuss transitioning children's needs and uh, their strengths and the IEP meetings and that kind of thing. We have a preschool that is provided through the school district that is funded uh, through a grant and that has been in place for a few years. Of course, kindergarten registration in the spring. Some of our early childhood educators work, have worked with um, SHAR as as she said, uh, through her position um, for trainings and other support. We have, there have been some fall activities before school starts that are hosted by the schools within the school district. Uh, kindergarten teachers, as Becca has mentioned, um, uh, sorry, Nikki has mentioned that they worked with her uh, trying to incorporate highly impactful practices based on intellectually engaging activities within the classroom. I loved how that was put. <laughs> so I wanted to say that, that it, anyway, and I've been in and observed um, some of the work that they've done and it is incredible. I, I love it. So um, the school district also hosted a professional development night a couple of years ago um, where we invited Dr. Baldwin in to come and, and talk with all of the early childhood educators in our community, which kind of gave me uh, the first clue that there was some interest in our community in furthering the work uh, going into this early childhood education and the transitions going into uh, school into kindergarten, I should say. We also have parents as teachers program and um, some other work uh, that has been done. Amber Merritt, uh, one of our early childhood educators, she has worked at, with on um, the Wyoming Coherent Path to Quality. She was part of that team. So anyway, um, do you wanna go to the next slide, Sure. So that stuff has already been in place, but with when I heard about this grant, um, I had some kindergarten teachers call me and say, hey, there's this grant that is going to be made available and we would love to apply for it, but we don't have time. And we thought that you might be interested in doing that. So they talked with me a little bit about it and I got really excited because I had just had a conversation with our administrator, administrative team about some pieces that we thought we felt were lacking in the work in the early childhood area. So I thought this was going to answer our questions. So and give us the key that we needed to to further that work. Anyway, so we went ahead and um, I watched the presentation by Albany County on the grant that they used last year. And uh, really, that really got me excited as well. There's just a lot of different things that came into play that I just felt like we were ready to do this. I did reach out to some other um, people and I worked with in the application process, Angela Burton, a kindergarten teacher, Janice Gilliland Rosales, um, who's a child development center head teacher and Amber Merritt, who has a child care facility here. So we all worked together on the application so that it, it was, uh, yeah, we had all the different voices. So, do you wanna, okay. 
So there's this quote, no one person or perspective can give us the answers we need to the problems of today. Paradoxically, we can only find those answers by admitting we don't know. We have to be willing to let go of our certainty and expect ourselves to be confused for time. And I feel like there were several people in our community um, that were not super excited about engaging in this process. There were others who were very excited about it. So we just went ahead and um, felt like we were gonna jump into this, I, I don't wanna call it a black hole, but this really open-ended process <laughs> um, that has been a little bit scary. Um, I will be honest, as we've gone through the process, it's been a little bit hard for some of us who like to just find a solution and just go with it. Um, so anyway, but we don't know all of the answers. So that's part of this process. We have to remind ourselves. Do I go to the next slide, Chair? So the process that we took, um, of course, I like I said, have talked with different people in the early childhood community. And we decided there's, we have up to 80 people in our community that fit into this um, category of early childhood educators that could have been part of this process. And that was a pretty large, overwhelming number of people to be in on um, key decision-making things and so we decided that we would start with a smaller group and have a leadership group um, that meets together as well as then the large group um, and the the leadership team and we made sure includes members of child care preschool kindergarten administrators um, all aspects of the that community so we have all of those key um, voices in there. And the purpose of that group, I think Shar is going to talk about a little bit later, but we wanted to make sure that we just, the purpose of the leadership group is just to kind of keep us focused as we go into the large group, and then we can finish making those decisions as a large group. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions about the, the difference between the, the two different groups, but, but that's kind of where we, where we started. And I feel like it's been a pretty, a, a pretty good place to, to begin and to go with. Yes, so. <clears throat> absolutely. And so this is about the time that I was brought in. Um, they asked me to come in and, and help facilitate these meetings um, because this grant process for this group of people was was like a, like a planning fact finding part, um, not just a, let's come up with an idea together and jump on it. I loved Nikki's example earlier when she said we don't just um, get people together and decide something. We have to know all of the all of the parts first. We have to be as close to experts as we can be first, and then we brainstorm and come up with solutions. So that was our goal, and we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But I came in kind of as a neutral person. I'm not a childcare um, or, or an educator in this community. Um, I'm also not in the school district. Um, so it was just a really fantastic opportunity for me. I, I came into this group of people that were just so dedicated and excited to be there and ready to, to just jump in and, and do this thing. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, it was like the perfect um, setup because here we have these kindergarten teachers that have been working with Nikki um, and having those stimulating and engaging activities also known as play. <laughs> I loved that they made that sound so good because it is, that's what it is, but um, it has to sound as good as it is, right? Um, so these kindergarten teachers came in and they knew the value of play. I mean, there was, there was no question. And so it was just perfectly, they were just ready to go in this process. Um, and so that was really exciting. Um, we came together first as a leadership group. Oh, but having come together, um, everyone who was, was part of this had read um, uh, Nikki's um, paper that she wrote about understanding and supporting transitions in early childhood education. Um, they had all had a copy of Wyoming's Coherent Path to Quality, and they all had 
had access to um, NAEYC's developmentally appropriate practice document that has uh, the newer version. Um, and so they were just primed and ready at this first meeting when we came together. And the first thing that we did, we, we introduced ourselves and then we made a list of what our dream for the children in Star Valley was. What did we want for them? What could we, what did we want to give them? If we could give them anything, what would it be? And we just started brainstorming that, those things. And that led to our vision. And um, it was just, that was so much fun. We just, we kind of sat in that space for a little bit of just, if we could have anything for them, what would it be? And um, we were able to have that conversation. Um, and then after that, we were able to discuss our mission and our purpose um, and what we could accomplish with the transition grant and what we wanted to find out so that we knew more. Um, we made an agreement to be willing to commit to confidentiality, to stay loyal to the process and the people and to support one another along the way. And we also committed to the process of learning together and using our learning to shape what we decided. So we did, we, we did look at a lot of quotes to help keep us grounded in what we were really doing. It's really easy to get narrowed in on, let's find an answer right now. And so we, we did different things to try to expand our minds and open our minds. And this is one of them. Um, I'll go ahead and read it, even though I know you guys can see it, but um, we can't be creative if we refuse to be confused. Change always starts with confusion. Cherished interpretations must dissolve to make way for the new. Of course, it's scary to give up what we know, but the abyss is where newness lives. Great ideas and inventions miraculously appear in the space of not knowing. If we can move through the fear and enter the abyss, we are rewarded greatly. We rediscover we are creative. We really looked at this quote quite often because those of you who work in school districts and I did formally, so I feel like I can say this, know that it's hard not to know things we need to have answers and we need to move forward with those answers immediately <laughs> is what it feels like. Um, and it's just because of the stress that's put on, on you um, in many ways. And it was just so lovely that we didn't have to rush into any decisions. We were here to learn together. And we just focused on sitting in the messiness is one of the, one of the ways that we talked about that. And Emily, did you wanna add anything to this? I think you did about the, the district administration. Oh, did I? I did, sorry. <laughs> I forgot that we talked about that. That was one of the things I, I told Char um, that it was hard for me where I work with the administrators quite closely. Um, I could tell when we were talking about this, this grant before we even applied, it was, it was hard for them to give up some of that um, control that they usually have um, over over different things to bring someone outside of the community in. And um, Nikki and Becca know that there was a, a, another person that they had we had talked about um, having as our facilitator. But when we talked to the administrators, they were really kind of against it and they wanted they actually kept wanting me to do it. And I was, I didn't want that. That wasn't going to be my role during this process. I wanted to be sure that we had an outside person. And we talked to Shar because she had worked with other people and was a known person in the community um, here with our early childhood people. So anyway. All right. Thanks, Emily. And um, I mean, to be fair, it is, we do, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like I'm being down on, um, administration and in the slightest, um, the administration there in Star Valley was so supportive and even came to our meetings um, almost every time we had at least two to three administrators there. So they were wonderful. It was just a point, it was just a part of just kind of changing what we normally do, right? Breaking out of that, that norm. And they were willing to do it, although it was hard and challenging. Um, Lauren, could you put the NACI uh, resource, the DAP, in the chat, I'm calling her out. Hopefully she's available. Okay. Yep, thank you. Video. She's kind of our go-to with that kind of stuff. And I really appreciate you for that. Okay, so that was a really great segue into this next slide, which is our uh, leadership team that Emily referred to. So the leadership team was not a group of people that made all the decisions 
and then came together and told the whole group what, what they were thinking and tried to get them on board. And that was really, really important for them. Um, they did not want to be that way. And, and we didn't want them to be that way. The leadership group was someone who helped us focus on what our, keep us grounded and focused on our vision. And um, they were not the decision makers. It was really, really evident to people who came to the whole group meeting um, or the large group meetings that they were the ones who were making the decisions. And that was, again, sitting in the messiness, that wasn't always easy. Um, facilitating a large group and making decisions together is never easy, but man, it's so worth it. And it was really exciting for me and new experience for me to do that. Um, so it was really, um, really, really intentional that that leadership group was um, a nice sampling of all the community and all the different types of um, people who worked with young children, but also um, they were there just to help lend a voice and keep our focus. So I thought that was really cool. Um, here's the purpose that they came up with. Um, and you can just look over that. I thought that they did a beautiful job of um, coming up with what they really wanted to hold on to as a leadership group. I especially love that first one. They really did a good job with this and will continue to just representing the needs, concerns, and interests of the large group. They were always thinking of that large group and that's what really helped us to be successful. And then also advocating for the children and families and holding on to our vision and mission. That was just, it was, it was a really um, wonderful way of, of going through this process together. Um, okay, so the next thing that we did was we came up with, um, we in coming up with our vision, um, it was a really, uh, again, that was the large group that helped decide what our vision was. Um, and the way that we did that was there was a lot of um, reflection that happened, and then there was some group discussion. Um, there was sharing in small groups and then sharing with the whole groups. We looked for common themes and threads. Uh, we wrote down uh, the, different, the different parts. We reworded them, made sure we remembered all the things. We, we, um, then we put all of our different parts up along the wall and we wanted them after everybody had approved of every single one. Um, and I'll show you the finished product here in just one minute. But then they wanted to order them according to what was most important because we knew they were all important, but we wanted, you know, we wanted it to be ordered. So that's what this picture represents is we put it on chart paper and then everyone had sticky notes and they ordered them one to five. There are going to be five of them um, of what they thought should be the order of these statements for our vision. And that was really um, that was a really fun Thing. And it was really interesting how everyone felt very similarly um, about what the order of these should be. So um, I will show you what our vision statement is. And I would like to invite you to look at the wording of what they came up with. Um, I think they did a wonderful job. And just at least think to yourself, but if you'd like to put in the chat, what are some words that really stand out to you that they used here? Um, they, I, they did, a, so they had put some pretty, uh, exciting and strong language in their vision for Star Valley children. Wonder and joy, Britt. Thank you. Yes. Isn't that so beautiful? And that comes from the NAEYC, a developmentally appropriate practice document. Um, Cindy said safe, empowered and celebrated. Nikki said, celebrated as learners, empowered and confident learners. Yes, yes. All the words, Brittany says. <laughs> I agree. I feel like they did such a wonderful job with this. Um, I loved, I also loved celebrated. Um, I'm not sure if that one has been mentioned in the chat yet either, but I just, oh yeah, it was. Nikki did. Um, celebrated is such an important one. Um, but this is, this is what they, their vision for those children were. And we reviewed it often and held tight to it. Play as a central tool for learning. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so once we had this, honestly, this took us a lot of time, <laughs> but we felt like it was worth it because we did use it often. Now it was time for us to come up with our mission. 
Um, as we came up with the mission, that honestly was a lot easier. And I think it's because we had worked so hard on this vision. We knew our vision. And so now we just had to figure out how to get to it. Um, so this is the, the mission of the learning community. Um, and I feel like they're, they're again, their wording on this was really powerful just to focus on the whole child, identify and build on children and family strengths. And that one was a really wonderful one as far as that strength-based. Um, and the bi-directional communication was a big one, um, but bridging that gap. Then we came up with our purpose for that learning community. And again, it uh, came quite easily because of the um, clear vision um, of this group. And I'll just let you read through it. Um, I especially loved that first one, to unite as a strong force for good. I think that every um, early childhood educator in the world feels that way. And I just love it. I think that that's, that is just so beautiful. And it, you know, we can unite under that. Okay, so these were our goals and focus. We knew that we had this window. We met at the end of August and we had until December. Um, and we were going to really hone in on this time to learn about families and children's experiences in their kindergarten transition. We wanted to learn about each other and what's happening across the different settings with the lens of what does this mean for kids. And then we wanted input from everyone who spends time with children. We wanted um, to hear everybody's voice and experience. And these were the three, three main things that we wanted to focus on in our, our three months together in the work that we would be doing. So we started out by asking um, what we ask children and families to do. And Nikki did such a beautiful job of really sharing this with us. Um, the readings that we had done really informed this discussion um, that I had mentioned earlier. And just about, we came to the same conclusion through our own experiences and discussion that the research shows that it really is the children that carry that load and that we need to help them carry that load. And how can we do that? So um, this was just some of our thoughts on this chart paper that we had as we discussed all of the millions of things that we asked them to be ready to do every single day. And you know, a lot of times right out of the gate of getting there, what do they need to be able to do? And it's all new <laughs> and it's all challenging. So we talked about um, how we wanna help transfer that burden um, onto, onto all of us. Um, so with our different, we, we knew we wanted to be really informed and we wanted to um, have all the knowledge that we could as we go forward and learn together. So um, I already mentioned the readings. Um, we also did, and I will go into some detail with the, the last three in just a moment, but we did site virtual visits. We did um, the, all, all members who wanted to of this group were, were um, paid, they had the funding to go to the NAEYC annual conference. It was lovely that it was virtual um, so that anybody who could or wanted to uh, would be able to. And then we did a transition um, family survey to see, to get the family's input on that. So with our, the sharing of spaces, we wished we could go into each other's spaces and even more, we wanted to go into each other's spaces during the day and see what was happening with the kids. Obviously that was not realistic. So we did not do that. But what we did was we, we had everyone from the different um, parts of the spectrum from um, kindergarten to preschool, to childcare, to all of, you know, the CDC, all of the different parts, um, share, take pictures and share what it was like in a day in their space. So what was it like for children and families? Um, and then they, they shared with us that evening. And so, um, I just put a few pictures on here. This was one of the, um, the family home childcare that we saw. Um, this was one of the preschools. This was LUCDA, which is a Lincoln Uwina uh, Child Development Association, um, and then the kindergarten. So the really, um, it was it was a really wonderful experience and a lot of fun to hear um, 
these different educators talk about their spaces. And we definitely saw strengths in each space and we felt inspired by the work that everyone does. Um, and it even sparked some conversations about how uh, I heard different educators talking about how they can bring things that they saw into their own space. And that, that alone, to me, those conversations alone helped with transitions um, because they were kind of breaking down those um, differences that were simple. We want to keep everyone individual, but when there's small things that are good ideas, then why not use them in more than one place? All right, Emily, did you want to talk about this really quick? Yeah, so um, after we attended the, the NACI annual conference, uh, there were 26 of us that signed up to attend, and we had a Zoom meeting the week after just to kind of recap and um, find out some of the highlights that people had found um, as they attended classes just to share out some of those if um, while we still had access to the conference for the rest of the month so we could go in and, and watch those um, classes if people were interested and these are just some of the highlights I'll let you just kind of read through those but these are just some of the highlights that our educators found from those classes that they attended that they shared. Okay, so again, some awesome learning experiences and getting new knowledge that we were able to use. Um, and then the last thing was our family survey. So we made this, um, this, this was a long process that we went through together, again, as a whole group. So that was really interesting, but so important. Uh, we reflected, we brainstormed, we discussed in small groups, we collaborated as a whole group to come up with the questions. We decided we wanted to know about two different groups of people. We wanted to know about people who had had their child go through the transition into kindergarten. And we wanted to know about the people who hadn't yet, but their kid was going to, and they were feeling, how, how were they feeling about it? How are they feeling about their child going into kindergarten? So um, we, so it was basically two different questionnaires that we had that started with, as you can see on the slide, the first question, and then it would take them through the different, the different questions for it. And what we did, what we found was uh, once we got all the information, we brought it to our large group. We split them into groups according to question. They read through them and found commonalities, themes, things that stood out, even if they were outliers. And then we put them on chart paper and then we walked around and looked at them and we found um, everything that we needed to know, we felt like from it. What came from that is, is we realized that there's a lot of things that we still would like to know. <laughs> Isn't that happen? Doesn't that happen when you like get new information? You're like, wow, I have more knowledge and I realize there's even more I don't know. So uh, we, we talked about that. Um, we discussed what what more do we want and need to know from families and uh what can we use so just really quickly i know we're getting short on time um we were just some of the things that we were surprised about were that the the children that went to pre pre-k did better um, in their transition into kindergarten so that's something that we want to explore we want to know why and figure out, kind of dig into that to see, you know, what are the actual factors that going to preschool helps with kindergarten? And then that way, hopefully we can help families who don't, who choose not to do preschool to still have some of those things, right? Um, we found out that parents have a lot of anxiety over their child going into kindergarten. Um, that, was a, that was surprising to us. Uh, a major theme was how long the days were and how the, the kiddos were tired and stressed by the end of the kindergarten day. Um, we realized how tied to trauma transitions really are. Um, we saw that social concerns were more than we had originally thought. We thought that the concerns were more with academics and knowing their teachers, but found out it was actually even more about, you know, if they'll have friends at school and if they'll get along with the other kiddos. And then just communication between teachers and families. So this really um, emphasized to us the focus on relationships between children and between children and the teacher and between the teacher and the family. Um, and we definitely talked about what we're still curious about. So um, some of the gains that we that we decided that we had made was we built relationships across all these settings and then we had a safe space to be together. There was a lot of misconceptions that were dissolved by our time together. 
and it banished isolation. We loved that. We loved being together and there's always food involved. Must always have food. We decided that from the very first meeting and Emily was such a, um, a hero with that. She always had delicious food and desserts for us. And that was an important part. Um, we realized that there was more alignment between the settings than we had originally thought. Um, we realized it really humanized everyone. There were no pedestals. We found that a lot of early childhood educators had put kindergarten teachers on these pedestals. And although kindergarten teachers are wonderful and amazing and they had so much to bring, they are just humans too. And they're just doing the best that they can as well. And I think, and there was some of the other as well. Uh, kindergarten teachers thought that these early childhood educators just had everything together and did such a beautiful job. And it was good for the educators to all see that with each other. And we all had a shared common goal. So um, what we're going to do next in the next phase is we're excited to take this information, get even more information, but also start to, to make some changes and uh, take those small wins um, and also look at the, the larger changes that can be made. Um, we're going to move our location to try to accommodate more people. We're going to send out notes to people in hopes that they, um, with the if they've missed a meeting, they can eat more easily come back to the next one and be um, up to date on what we talked about. Um, and we've just realized how committed everyone is to learning and, and growing together and making the needed changes. So um, we're just excited to continue to close that gap between childcare and kindergarten and to continue to better understand what children need, especially through their parents' eyes. And we want to continue our learning about different settings and programs and better understand expectations of both families and each other. And the main thing that always came up was that it was done in the Star Valley way. So that's something that's like a saying there. And I love it so much because that is exactly what this transition grant is all about. We take this research that is just everyone knows and it's developmentally appropriate and it's just the right way to do things. But that alone isn't enough. It needs to be part of the community. So we, th these um, educators would come and they would say, okay, this is the way Star Valley does it. How can we use the, the research and put those two together? And it was just so exciting. I loved that everything we did, we worked hard to make it be the Star Valley way. And that's what we're gonna continue to do. So I'll stop my sharing. And um, I guess I'll turn it back over to Nikki. Sure. And I, I just wanted to jump in as we wrap up and uh, just call out. I think you guys did a great job of pointing this out, but this is a process that you intentionally really slowed down. And um, I really respect that th those are the decisions that you all made, because what will come from this next, the ideas that will emerge from this in the next phase of this grant, I'm really excited to find out what those are, because they're going to be grounded in this common set of understandings from your whole team and that whole community. So can't wait to see what comes next. And I think Becca can speak about this. There's room uh, in this grant funding to, to have that time um, before you plan your next steps. And I don't know, Becca, if you wanted to chime in. Yeah, and I I wanna note too, we we could have taken the entire time this morning to you know into this afternoon to just highlight these two communities and how they're different and how they're alike and how um, they've come to, to carry out the activities um, that we, we heard from them today. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's obviously very different for the reasons that you heard. You know, Lincoln County is very much in this uh, planning process um, that they intentionally slowed down to sit in that space and learn together. And, and actually, we think that's really fundamental what we didn't hear from Jackson is what that process for learning together really looked like. And so I, I just wanna acknowledge for those of you who are like, oh my gosh, I just, I'm ready to take my kindergarten classroom and put a whole bunch of vet supplies in there. Like we're with you, right? We wanna, we wanna do that work as well, but there's a lot that we didn't hear that really underlied their planning process. And um, that's already embedded into the infrastructure in Jackson in terms of a systems of education, and a focus on early childhood and collaboration that's really strong. Um, and so lest you want to jump to implementation, please know that this planning process is so, so important um, as we think about the work that's ahead. Um, and so I guess I would 
I would note that to begin with and um, encourage you to think too about some of the pieces that are implied, if not declared, um, that each of these two communities said, which was really um, about relationships, which Nikki acknowledged from the evidence base is the most important thing that we can think about um, as we do this work. And that's um, relationships with people who are working directly with children, that's relationships with families. And that's having those relationships um, that Emily acknowledged can be a little uncomfortable sometimes with school district or uh, policy administrators and others who are looking uh, for the linear path uh, to get to this work. Um, and so Britt didn't have a chance to say it either, but the administration and Teton County School District has also been really incredible and they've given a lot of latitude to teachers um, and to others to make decisions uh, within and across the community. So um, a lot of really exceptional relationships and support are, are going into this work that um, are worthy of noting as we think about the readiness that each of these communities had to tackle this work. Um, so there is, as we think ahead to what the opportunities are with this grant, a lot of possibilities and opportunities for us to reach out and connect with you to understand what is happening um, across communities and to understand what your needs are and how we can support you or what your interest is in this work around transitions within and across that early childhood system and ultimately into um, the, the K-12 system. So um, we could we could continue this narrative far longer than we have scheduled for today. So thank you, Dina and Margie and the team at the WDU for allowing us to have this time to share out with you. Um, and we hope that this is the beginning of that narrative and we look forward to uh, answering some of these questions and addressing some of the wicked problems, like how do we find all of those children and families who are not part of that system before kindergarten um, and otherwise. So please do reach out to us. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. We want to support you in the work that you're doing. We also want to connect you um, to Britt and Alex and the team in Teton County and Char um, and Emily and others in Lincoln County. So um, we are happy to be connectors um, for all of you. And we really uh, look forward to all of the work that's ahead. Nikki, I don't know if you have closing comments or if we can just pass it on to Dina and Margie, but. I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, I, first of all, that was a great segue. I have been totally filled today and I think that all of us have been, I, I think I can speak for all of us. What a wonderful, you know, when a vision has is made and you come up with a some an idea, um, such as, you know, for the state, Margie had this beautiful vision and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna steal her thunder. I, I know that I wanted her to be able to give a few closing remarks today because um, really from the state's point of view, from the, the Department of Ed, um, this was a vision that she had. And it's amazing how all of these other pieces came together. You know, Becca and Nikki with the grant and all the other work that they were doing behind the scenes and for us to be able to come together um, and to do this as a state has just been phenomenal. And all the footwork that they continue to do, I'm so appreciative. <clears throat> because they're the ones out there doing the footwork in your schools and helping to pull this together. So thank you, thank you. Um, I put, someone had asked about a link from the very first early childhood summit. Um, there were some materials. So if, you know, and I love that you guys have talked about relationship building and the, the school districts and the CDC is working together because that was our hope in the very beginning of this when we did the first summit. Um, and I love that now there's been opportunities for you guys to share all of the wonderful things that you're doing with each other. Because I know for myself, as um, a previous special education teacher in the district, and I did, you know, watching this kindergarten transition come in, um, wow, what an important thing it is for, C for CDCs and, and community preschools and school districts to work together. And to see it happening and in the way that it's happening and to for you to share these beautiful, beautiful examples has just filled my bucket today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Margie with some closing remarks. And then we'll, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. And 
I will turn it over to Margie now. Thank you. Well, it is so hard to follow all the fabulous and encouraging things that have been said and shared today. I'm in awe of the work that you guys are doing and the knowledge that you're sharing. And I, you know, it's so hard to, you know, Dina shares so much enthusiasm and passion. She was really the right person to bring to WDE to help begin this process of collaboration across state agencies and across the state really in early childhood. I just, on behalf of the Wyoming Department of Education and the, specifically the Special Education Programs Division, I wanna thank each and every one of you for what you brought the last two days for participating, your questions, your discussion, um, our guest speakers and our presenters, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we really want to have yearly um, early childhood summits because early childhood is the foundation. You guys lay the foundation for the next 80 years for children. It is so vital and important what you do, and we want to support that work. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that next year we'll be in a different place with this pandemic and illness and all of this, and that maybe we can work with UW and have an on-site conference in Laramie and in partnership with UW, I would just love to build something fabulous and bring all of you guys there and even, you know, do things to help support getting you guys there. So really, really want to keep this work moving forward. And that happens because you guys have shown interest and showed up. So thank you so much for that. I also want to say thank you to Dina and Jennifer Duncan, who have done so much background work, not only to plan this conference, but then to replan it virtually. And that has been a lot of work. And um, if you guys know anything about Dina Smith, man, she is a workhorse. She makes things happen. And so I'm so grateful that we have her on the team. And so thank you guys for supporting her. And thank you, Dina, for what you've done. Um, I wanted to leave us with a couple um a couple pieces of encouragement. I want to leave you guys with a few reminders of how valuable what you guys do in early childhood every day is. And a few quotes came to mind. One is that education is not preparing for life. It is life. Education is life. It lays the foundation for poverty or wealth for children, for their ability to advocate for themselves or to give up. So many things that you do give life. So thank you for pouring yourselves out and for giving life to to our children in our community, our Wyoming citizens, our youngest citizens. And um, I really appreciate that. The other thing I wanted to share is that the first five years have so much to do with the next 80 years. And so we have to, in education, focus our energy, not just on standards, you know, not just on state assessments, not just on coursework and graduation requirements, but we have to talk about those foundational pieces, that work that, that Nikki has been doing and Becca have been doing around what are those early skills and resources that we need to make sure that our communities have. So um, again, just, it, it's so critical what you do. And the last quote that I have comes from Aristotle. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And so I'm just thinking back on that very beginning presentation around um, self-care and community care, taking care of one another, teaching kids empathy. I mean, I even think about situations. I, I can think back on this moment when I was the principal of Indian Paintbrush Elementary School, and we had that horrific shooting that happened out in Connecticut. And I was in pieces in my office. I was watching the news happen. My teachers didn't even know yet, right? And I literally walked into a kindergarten classroom and I sat down on the floor and the kids, kids dogpiled me. Like, you know, you guys can picture it, right? Principal comes and sits on the floor. All the kids are like all over me, giving me hugs. And, you know, and I think about, I, I didn't say anything to the kids, but I could have said, Miss Robertson's having a rough moment. And the kids took care of me in that moment, right? I remembered why what we do is important. So, you know, I just think again, remembering the importance of valuing one another, you know, um, again, that relationship piece, parents valuing ed educators, educators valuing parents, CDCs and school districts valuing what each other does for children and the uh, collaboration and working together that can only happen if we can really build those relationships. So I hope this has been an opportunity to build relationships. I hope this has opened the door. I just want to invite you guys, if you have ideas, if you have thoughts about how the Special Education Programs Division can support your work in the state, you send an email to Dina or I, we really are interested in hearing from you. Put your comments in the evaluation about how we can make this better. Our desire is every year to get better. And so that really comes from getting feedback from you. So. 
With that, I just want to say thank you, not only for being here today, but showing up every day for our children. And um, Dina, thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to you. I don't know if you have anything, some, any clothing, closing business, but thank you guys so much.